In Fallout New Vegas, role-playing is only limited by your imagination. For example, what if you had an aptitude for lockpicking, but rather than being a pesky thief or becoming a Peter Pan wannabe, your sole purpose in life was to become the world's most dangerous philanthropist. An anti-kleptomaniac that likes to watch pants explode, provided that they're still being worn. So, ladies and gentlemen, pets and plants, hydrate yourselves, because this is the story of Teeter Tan, Peter's special cookie of a cousin. So, can you eat Fallout New Vegas by only reverse pickpocketing explosives? A tickle to the brain and a weird dream later and Mr. Tan's grey mass is now echoing a need to not engage in regular combat unless it involves an ofrenda so explosive it would put Taco Bell to shame. He also likes nachos now. Oh, and he's got a weird ick where he ever meets a man named Lenius, he'll do anything but reverse pickpocket him. And the stats that only mildly represent this courier are... 9 in perception and luck, 8 endurance, 6 in intelligence and agility and 1 in everything else. He is most experienced in explosives, sneak and medicine, since he is absolutely amazing at not tasting his own. And the two traits that only kind of define him are built to destroy simply for the accurate description and Logan's loophole. To be clear, this build sucks more than an escort, but that'll only add to the challenge. In Good Springs, the first thing I want is to get that Chinese Army Ops manual for the extra sneak points. And since I'm going to do Sunny's tutorial for the experience, might as well just grab some Xander Root now. Chat sells me the only two explosives he has, which add to the other 12 dynamite that choosing explosives as a tact skill granted me. Some grave digging, a snow globe and some butts later and I've just realized that the Brock flower only spawns after the tutorial? Why do you do this, New Vegas? Anyways, Easy Pete tells me the stories of his scavenging days, which had fuck all to do with the dynamite I want to get from him amid Ringo's quest. Oh, and Sunny asks me to shoot three bottles with a varmint rifle. I knocked them all down, thinking I was slick, but no. I still had to shoot the fallen bottles, except I no longer have a smirk on my face. She then invites me to go shoot some geckos, but geckos ain't bottles, and that goes against everything this courier believes in. So I politely stand aside like a retired cheerleader that can either cheer or leave. Oh, come on! Not only can I not fight back against the geckos chasing me, but I won't be able to get Easy Pete's dynamite using the skill check. And I needed that. To make matters worse, Barton didn't spawn either, so I can't even do the first gag I had in mind. And this is where the improv begins. Gene must have went skydiving, the locked locker had nothing of real use, so I head back to Good Springs. I go to the schoolhouse to grab that stuff boy, cause I do have the lockpicking for it. But I had to parkour in a counter, cause you can't really reverse pickpocket mantises. Or any animal slash creature for that matter. To my dismay, even Victor is immune to it. Every time I tried, his dialogue just opened up. After that, I gifted Michi Boy with a long fused dynamite. Trouble. And tried to get the steam packs from his inventory, but it simply wasn't opening. Fortunately, going outside and back in fixed it, and I managed to get them. Well, it. And it's now time to give back to the town. Chat got live dynamite, and that's when I remembered that maybe. I can still get that dynamite from Easy Pete. Lovely! In the saloon, the NPCs are aggroed. And that's when I realized that Trudy and Joe Mama still showed up. It uh, took them three business days to come after me, but Trudy does chase me. I do manage to get into the house with the BB gun, the one that has the bed we can rest in it. And after sleeping for three days with Trudy right beside me, she simply introduces herself, tells me how glad she is to finally meet me and since the town has decided to forgive me, I, in return, give her some exploding pants right when she's leaving the house. So did it work? The kill cam says yes, but that was odd and I think I just found my favorite kill ever. Unfortunately, this aggroed the whole town again, which made me sleep for yet another three days. And just to manage the survivors explaining this wild week to anyone passing by. Curiosity then gets the best of me and I go to Joe to see if I can still do his quest since more powder gangers could mean more dynamite. And uh, I can, so he asks me to take care of Ringo and to come back once that's done. In the gas station, Ringo gets some dynamite stuck in his pants. 
Level 2 comes around and I go with Swift Learner since both the quests and enemies I'll be able to deal with are very, very limited. Back to Joe and as the Potter Gangers start approaching the town, I realized that all I needed to do was follow them. Cause everyone they'd interact with have passed away due to unnatural causes. I've decided to let Mayor Joe stick around as a backup dynamite container since I'm pretty certain he'll have one or two sticks with him. I then travel back to Gene skydiving to steal dynamite from the other Powder Gangers. The ones right behind the chuck are in disarray with a bloat fly that's practically a mile away and that gives me an opening to steal their goodies. I also got the powder charge mines laid by the ones in the powder ganger camp west, although I did have to sneak my way into their stashes of dynamite. The courier then had to clutch his butthole cause apparently I forgot to grab one of the mines and on the way to Sloan, two powder gangers start shooting at me. Why though I'm good with Joe and the dudes I've stolen from did not aggro on me. Anyways, as I'm being chased, another two powder gangers start to make a move, except they start to run towards Sloan. That's something I've never seen. Is this because I helped Ringo? Is it a random event? Either way, they do attack slow. Chomps takes them down with a sledgehammer and that means six more dynamites for me. Nice. He then advises me not to head up north, but who in their right mind would listen to a guy named Chomps? I pass through Neil's shack, he seems to think I'm taller than I actually am, and I continue my journey to the strip. I do the tiniest detour to get the NCR Ranger safe house map marker cause it'll be useful later. Then pass through Cassidy Caravan's wreckage and make my way to the gun runners to sell everything I don't need. Unfortunately, the Vendertron didn't seem to have a single explosive. So I head on to Mick and Ralph's and luckily they have exactly what I wanted. Right after and instead of going into an ambush where I couldn't fight back, I leave Freeside's east gates and re-enter the town from the north one. I grab the snow globe from the Fuller's Fort, sell three magazines to Francine, and hey, we'll finally be able to pass the cap check. Some thugs come after me, I do the cap check and stick around to see old Ben mow down the thugs and to have a little chat since that'll trigger the squatter cause you know how much this courier enjoys watching pants explode. Victor then invites us to become the first person to set foot in the Lucky 38 in about 200 years, so we oblige. Robert then reminds me that I got shot because of the platinum chip I never delivered to him, and then he asks me if I like his part of the town. I do. I get the snow globe from the cocktail lounge and upon leaving an NCR member tells me he's a courier as well and that the ambassador will love to meet me. But. I'd rather have a drink in Gamora than to do that. Oh, and this happened. I had dinner at the Ultra Lux the other night. I told them my steak tastes funny. They said it was a clown. I ate a person. So yeah, dynamite. Homicide detected. <laughs> I like to pretend that line followed by utter inaction is that Securitron's way of thanking me. You're welcome, buddy. Then I got all the free magazines I could and went on into the Ultra Lux to tell Mortimer that Billy's bad publicity will no longer be an issue. He invited me for lunch, but I didn't feel like being the main course, so I went to the Vault 21 gift shop instead. I pickpocketed Sarah's key, which I immediately regretted. Not because she caught me, but stealing is wrong. So to redeem myself, I gave her a malfunctioning dildo. Oh, and she wanted me to watch, that's so kinky. Anyways, snow globe and to the tops. Approaching Ben is enough to complete the quest and get a lot of experience, which I really need to be honest. And upon seeing him pass by, I uh, I don't know how I should best approach this. Cause not giving up my weapons will make them all aggro, so that's out of the question. And I don't feel like gathering clues for Spunk. Level 4 comes around, all the points were dumped into explosives and the second perk I took was also Swift Learner. And the greeter, he told me that my weapons were locked behind the casino's cashier, but that would require 100 in lock picking, which I don't have. And when I tried to jump on the counter to see if I could reach the locker, oh, the look she gave me was priceless. I then checked Swank's inventory, but he had nothing worth it. Benny's room was locked behind a 50 lock picking check, which I also don't have, so I go and meet the man himself. Benny! He offers me the presidential suites for us to talk in private, but refuses to come with. 
So that just screams ambush. I politely decline and tell him, I'll just carry the situation then, but Swung told me the cigarette butts. And going into the Lucky 38 is not enough proof. So now I wonder, because they never did it this way, but would Yes Man be enough proof? So in near disgust with myself, I pickpocket Benny's key when all I wanted was to gift him some dynamite, but yeah, obviously I have none with me. In Benny's room we find Yes Man, get a gist of the whole plan, and so I go back to Spunk, and Yes Man does work as enough proof. However, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if I tell Swank, I'll kill Benny, and he'll just be sent to his room, where he'll start an immediate dialogue with me before showing me Maria, right? So I tell Swank I'll just cut a deal with Benny, go to the big boss himself, and confront him about Yes Man. Baby, this is not the place to go talking about that. Okay, so the ambush feels dumb, but going back to Swank, I no longer have the option to test sending Benny to his room, so fine, ambush for one, please. Baby, this little meet and greet of ours, chalk me up as a no-show. All of his bodyguards then show up to try and turn me into Swiss cheese. But as I'm running to the door, I decide to chat up Swank. And he tells me that he saw Benny go to his bedroom, and by now he's long gone, yeah. But I want to see what Yes Man has to say. He came through here in a big hurry. Didn't even stop to say hello. I think he went down his secret escape elevator out in the hall. I, I don't know why I thought checking the elevator Benny used was a good idea, because I knew it would still be inaccessible. So, all in all... What I got was one stabby boy and three gun enthusiasts in a small corridor. But I do manage to go past them, no one else is aggroed, so I just leave the casino. Vulpes then tells me that there's a baldy that's more hyped about me than my parents were in these last 10 years. And gives me some weird jewelry. Time to travel back to the NCR safe house and make our way into the 188. Unfortunately, the merchant didn't have any explosives for me, so I kept on going. And right before reaching Karanuth Cove, we see Anders cosplaying as Jesus. He asks for help, and... Oh right, Anders is the one crucifix boy that can be saved. Which means I can go into his inventory. Oh, that's great. I then show the jewelry that our sugar daddy has sent us to make a legion explorer jealous. And I tell Lucullus to start rowing. I disarm, give Benny the bombastic side-eye, and we go on to meet Baldi. He tells me that his long-life dream is to feel the ground shake, hands me the platinum chip, and invites me to mock Benny. Go ahead and laugh, baby. I ain't blind to the humor in this situation. We get to choose his fate. Yeah, Baldi said you'd get to decide. So which way you lean? Do you have a preference? Yeah. To die in my sleep at a ripe old age after a marathon session of Hey Hey with 36 star broads. Well, in the bunker, Mr. House passive aggressively notes that I'm ahead of schedule and asks me to upload the platinum chip. This whole area was just running and melting steam packs until I got to the console. And then it was a healthy dose of doing it again until I was back outside. I felt the ground shake a while ago. After acting on behalf of a make a wish, I felt blessed told Benny about the Securitrons beneath the fort and asked him if he'd like to be untied. To which his reply was pretty much, sure, let's fight our way through. So yeah, no, that's out of the question. And as I wanted to put a little something in his pants, right, my weapons are confiscated, so... Crucifixion it is! Level 8 comes around and I go for the second demolition expert perk. Useless, yes, but a fitting title. And before leaving the fort, I make a quick visit to Benny to say goodbye. Happy now, you twisted bum? Kinda, yeah. I then make my way into Camp Searchlight because there's a little something I can get to spice up this run. Holy frag grenades! You know, the ones from the Wild Wasteland perk that I didn't get? Oh, I forgot. But no matter. Two mini nukes, a sprinting session, and radiation poisoning later. And I go back to the 188, but Michelle doesn't have any rat away. So I might as well go and greet Veronica, who I invite to act as a key to opening up the Brotherhood's bunker for me. And oh, right, I still have that companion mod installed from the Roar Only Challenge, because I've got a Pokemon run in mind. 
In fact, I now have too many ideas. But that's a problem for future Kion. Anyways, I was unable to get to the bunker without Veronica fisting a scorpion. So, I had to reload and do that pilgrimage by myself. From the Hidden Valley, I went in Black Mountain's direction, not only to see some cool centaurs, but to get the Brotherhood's holotape. Specifically, the one that contains a password that I will not need. Yeah, when I entered the bunker, a paladin seemed to have misunderstood what the strip in the Mojave represents. And over everything you're carrying. Weapons, ammo, clothes, armor, everything. I want you stripped down to your underwear. And uh, that's not even all. I've told you what to do. Strip off your clothes and equipment or face summary execution. Okay then. And you know how this one goes. Ramos says hi. The Elder asks me to find a ranger. And this time, it's not on the premises of the valley. It's holed up in one of the bunkers. I'm not sure what triggers which, but he starts running like crazy for no reason. Although I do manage to gift him modern genes, and well, this happens. So I do it again, but this time I try to unrig the radio that would set off the explosion. Although it just grants me another near-death experience again. Okay, a nap later and we're good. Back to the Elder and he kindly removes the exploding collar he had put around my neck. I make a visit to Nitores, but she won't trade anything with me, so I decide it's time to go look for goodies elsewhere. But first, and in return for that unique experience that McNamara put me through, I decide to repay him with some live dynamite. Brothers mad, I start running like crazy, only to find a locked door behind a 100 skill check. And it's not like the password will help me, so I'm stuck until I reload. Not... Because I had the genius idea of popping up a stealth boy and it was just to see if it would give me some time to look for a spare key, but instead... Ramos stops being aggroed. I tried to trade in his key for some hot sauce, but I only got the key. And I'd really like to have my revenge, so I follow him back, do my thing, and he gets to see what happens when you try and be weird with the main protagonist. Back to Sloan, so I can mock chomps, and who do I find? Snuffles! Charming as always, such a cutie! And for that, we lend him a hand for his leg. And that's when I realized that some bark scorpions had followed me into the town, but Chomps took swift care of them. He then thanks me for patching up Snuffles, and I make my way through the fiends. Couple shots from far away, nothing much really. Although I did have a whole family of geckos running after me before I hit Red Rock Canyon. But as fortune would have it, they gave up midway. In the canyon's lab, Jack sells me some turbo, which might be really useful later. Then I go and meet George, the boomer that's not part of the boomers. We make a bet, and before I destroy all his hopes and dreams, he starts running to do it himself. Although, going after him only destroyed mine. Upon the game reloading by itself, he decided that jogging is not for him anymore. Got a hot potato in his pocket, I got my money, and it seems that the howitzer forgot to activate because I managed to get really close to the gate without even hearing it fire once. Raquel then forces me to meet Mother Pearl, who's so happy to finally meet someone new. As if they didn't bomb anyone that tried to show up sooner? I get the snow globe from their museum, find Mr. Cuddles, and also... A way to steal all the explosives they have that will be useful to me. And I could have just bought them if they were willing to trade, but they weren't. Not without me spending hours hey, doing tasks for them, them so the yeah, no. Lindsay gets an early oh, Christmas gift, so and that much. stealth boy gave me an idea on how to deal with Lenius. I mean, at least that's what my sweet naivety thought at the time, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Joe Mama gets a frag mine, does some ballet, and I took not only his stealth boy, but also his pride. I then go to Julie to get some right away and extra steam packs, and go back to the Lucky 38 to sell my snow globes for 8,000 caps. And uh, honestly, I was planning on using Luck 9 in the casinos to buy all the implants, but it seems like a meaningless plan now, so I've dropped it. Just yet another thing on the already ridiculous pile of stuff that didn't go my way. I then used the platinum chip to pay a visit to Bob, 
who gets very agitated about germs. Sterilizing the chamber turns him into barbecue and that's the best I can do since I cannot pickpocket him to begin with. Reporting success to Kaiser gave me some more experience and I've decided to do both Lucius and Vulpes's quests. Because if I become liked by the Legion, I'll get access to their safe house and that's a neat way to get a ton of stealth boys. And basically, Lucius wants a part for their howitzer and Vulpes needs a report on the spy they put on the strip. On my way, I find a disguise from Antarius that tells me of the cash that the Legion makes available for people that help them. And the last time that happened, I found a stealth boy, but there wasn't any. So, I steal the replacement part from the Boomer's Workshop head on to Vault 21, and that's when this dumb beauty happened. I managed to gift three Omerta thugs some life dynamite without having to reload even once. Now that's luck. But as a side effect, the Legion spy is very, very dead. So oopsie, Vulpes is not impressed. The howitzer has been upgraded and Lucius' quest isn't enough well to get the higher reputation status that I need. I try to double down, so I go back to Camp Searchlight and steal Aster and his battalion's tags to trade in to Aurelius, since each of them will yield me a bit of fame with the Legion. That still didn't do it, though. So I went into the strip and did the exact same thing to every single NCR member that I seen. Funny enough, I also noticed that Crocker didn't have one. Shouldn't he, though? But to make matters worse, I go back to Aurelius and that's still not enough to get me accepted. So I'm done and that's more of an exploding skirt than exploding pants, but that's on him. He could have made me a solid and put in a much better word with Baldi for me. Oh, and my man's so unhinged that he then starts breakdancing from the afterlife. What a weirdo. And uh, yeah, this is where I looked up stealth boy locations and ways to deal with both Oliver and Linnaeus and... Ah, it's impossible to pickpocket Linnaeus. Which means that only now have I realized that I have no charisma. I uh, just thought, yeah, let's do this run without speech to make it harder. But speech is a mechanic, using regular explosives is not reverse pickpocketing, so... Yeah, that was very stupid on my part. And now I have to pull a speech build out of nowhere unless I want to start the challenge from the beginning and I don't. So, to change the tide, I decide to win the lottery! And I settle on visiting Jack Rabbit Springs near Nipton since it has a stuff boy and all I need to do is to outrun centaurs. I then go back to Yes Man, put him in charge of the Lucky 38 and watch the demonstration. After that, I tell him I don't care about Kimball and he asks me to install an override chip in the Eldorado substation. But first... Let's take care of this build that needs to go from 9 speech into 100. <sighs> I have to do it. And so our first stop is the New Vegas Medical yeah, Clinic, Vegas where I'll be buying a copy of Meeting People, the Skill Magazine, and two implants from Dr. Uzanagi for charisma and endurance. I then go to Mick so I can purchase some naughty nightwear for those plus 10 points in speech. After that, I ran from some fiends, threw out the whole of Horowitz farm, nearly had a heart attack when I see Cazadores in the horizon, but eventually reach Brooks Tumbleweed Ranch to get a copy of the skill book, Lying, congressional style. Back in Freeside and I find another one in Cerulean Robotics. Without saying hi to Fisto, I ignore the rats, move towards the NCR Correctional Facility's main building and get yet another copy. Pass through Ranger Station Echo, north of Sniper's Nest and in a riskier move, I also decide to go into Lucky Jim's mine. Well, the building, not the mine. I then read the four books, but <laughs> my speech is still only on a base of 23, but that's without the attire and cams. And on an even bolder move that ended up as a massive dove, I go into Lonesome Road. <sighs> Thinking I'll get some free experience because going in will finish a quest. I uh, didn't get any experience, but shame is for losers, so I held my chin up high, used my feet to flee the coyotes and went back to the 188 and started heading into the Eldorado substation where... Uh, holy Janambush caught up to me. 
They aggroed, so I can't pickpocket any of them. Well, spamming steam packs and running like a little bee worked wonders. I reached the substation, still under heavy fire, got in, installed the chip and came back out. Level 10 comes around, speech goes to 36, I take the comprehension perk, realize the legion had dipped and make a quick stop in good springs to grab some whiskey. Feeling as defeated as I was feeling smart, I then go into Where's Camp McCarran to exploit an exploit so stupidly slow. <sighs> it's only worth it if you're really not willing to restart the run. I find Thomas, who wants to send me to a vault to collect some samples. And he doesn't even tell me that everyone he sent never came back. But Angela and her heart of gold do let me know and she's the savior of this run. Cause every time I ask her what she thinks of the doctor, a speech check option soon shows up. The uncomfort being that it's only 31 experience. So yeah, there will be a lot of goodbyes and doing the same thing over and over again. Oh. That's so boring. But also, it's not like I can go and shoot big horners. So yes, level 14 painstakingly came. I got speech to 75 and... That'll be enough. Cause again, this is without the nightwear or cams. Funny, cause when I first thought of this build, I imagined I'd be using Mad Bomber, a level 16 perk. But soon gave up on that idea since it would be a lot more useful in an explosives run rather than a reverse pickpocketing. And even then, you don't need level 16 for a run. Lovely on a series, not a challenge. But I finally have a way to deal with Laniyu, so I go to Yes Man. I tell him the good news and the Legion has started the second battle of Hoover Dam. The skirt boys use their howitzer to destroy the NCRs. I run through every single Legion member only having been shot twice and in the offices I go and sweet talk the two dudes in power armor. They now think that Colonel Moore is in danger which makes way for me to install the override chip in Hoover Dam. And upon doing so Yes Man then asks me to activate our army of Securitrons and obviously I do. On the east side of the dam, I once again only need to run and heal, something that won't be a viable strategy in the Legatus camp, where my mandatory Securitron manages to take down the gate guy but gets broken down into scrap metal by the following two dudes that like to feel a breeze on their nuts, so I just ran to Lenius. I made sure to pop a stealth boy before talking to him, I tease him, but I couldn't reverse pickpocket him. So I then decide to mock him again, but this time I took the stealth boy after the dialogue. It made no difference. Heck, I even tried to just run to the main gate to see if General Lee Oliver would show up earlier and fight him instead, but yeah, that's not a thing. And as such, I dress up in naughty nightwear, read a magazine, take cams, mix them with booze and charm up the antagonists. Into uh, doing exactly what Joshua did, except... Lanius won't get thrown off a canyon after being set on fire. What's up with these double standards though? Justice for Joshua, man! Also, I cannot move until Lanius gets into his tent. And that's inaccessible for me. I even tried the whole dialogue tree again to take Turbo, but I noticed he was already nowhere to be seen. Probably when the game allowed me to open up the Pip-Boy. So now... I've gotta find a way to reverse pickpocket the general, but I get close to the gate, it explodes. Obviously, I'm stuck in place, unable to pickpocket Lee Oliver, so I tell the Securitrons to attack them, pop another stealth boy just in case, and that's not letting me reverse pickpocket him. The thing is, I know it's possible, I just need to find a way to do it. And it took a bit of time, because I didn't want to look it up. In fact, I soon started stockpiling fragments on the floor just to see if he'd trigger them when approaching me. I even threw two long fused dynamites, one over the gates and one where I knew they would spawn, but that last bit did nothing whatsoever. Oh, and I also died before the mines detonated, so I tried it again, but this time took some turbo and I survived. Which uh, is actually good, because I need his pants to explode from within. 
And that's when I decide to see what happens if I just convince him to leave. Which is what I should have done from the start. And convinced, he won't aggro. So I take some turbo, frag grenade still at his feet, and I can finally put some dynamite up his ass. And that's a one hit KO, baby! So, you're welcome for the extra cool visuals. So, can you beat Fallout New Vegas using only reverse pickpocketing? Yep. Just don't do it with my initial build. And I'd like to give a quick shout out to Steve Whithall and to John Walker for their support of the channel. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope I'll see you on the next one. And I hope you have a good one. Bye. I guess I'll see you around. We accomplished a lot together. It was fun. Take care. And so the courier who had cheated death in the cemetery outside Good Springs cheated death once again. And the Mojave Wasteland was forever changed. The courier, with the aid of Yes Man, drove both the Legion and the NCR from Hoover Dam, securing New Vegas' independence from both factions. With Mr. House out of the picture, part of the Securitron army was diverted to the Strip to keep order. Any chaos on the streets was ended. Quickly. Chaos became uncertainty, then acceptance with minimal loss of life. New Vegas assumed its position as an independent power in the Mojave. Supporting all the chaos that comes with independence, the courier was the man responsible for a truly free New Vegas. He ensured the fall of Mr. House and the end of the Legion's and NCR's influence over New Vegas. With little law left in the wasteland, the Brooms continued to defend themselves against the prospectors and scavengers invading their territory. After the courier ensured New Vegas remained free, the followers found that independent Vegas was even more unstable and violent than before. Old Mormon Fort became excessively burdened by the influx of patients, struggling to provide even the most basic of services. Travelers continued to stop by Good Springs Source for water on the Long 15, but rarely would anyone venture into the ruins of Good Springs itself. Those who did were almost always tourists, come to visit the graveyard where the courier rose from the dead. The kings retained their control of Freeside, and while they continued to favor the needs of locals, they tolerated the citizens of the defeated NCR. The NCR, battered by the loss of the dam, were unable to devote any troops to retaking the correctional facility from the Powder Gangers. As a result, Powder Ganger raids on caravans became an unfortunate fact of life in the Mojave for years to come. Armed with a wide array of improvised explosives and stolen weapons, the Vault 19 Powder Gang tormented the Mojave Wasteland for years. Citizens of the NCR were favorite targets, and they always suffered the worst fates. And so the Courier's Road came to an end, for now. In the new world of the Mojave Wasteland, fighting continued, blood was spilled, and many lived and died just as they had in the old world. Because war, war never changes.